Hello. Welcome to my training on product-led growth, how to build a product that sells itself. This is honestly one of my favorite topics to talk about. And so before we really dive into it, I just want to take a step back and really kind of share with you why I am so incredibly passionate about product-led growth. So for me, it actually started over five years ago when I was working at a company called Vidyard, where we were launching a freemium product. Now, we had never done this before, never launched a freemium product. So there was a ton of new stuff, obviously, to learn. And so whenever we were launching this free product, um, what ended up happening is we got to hundreds of thousands of users signing up for our product very quickly. And at that specific moment, it totally changed my perspective on product. You see, before that happened, I was in demand generation and I had been spending hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to acquire leads for our sales team. The whole process was pretty basic, you know, where you would put up a landing page, create content, direct people towards that landing page. When they give you their contact information, you're sending them messages uh, with that contact info. And hopefully one day they, they turn into a happy paying customer. But we were really falling short on how we were delivering value. You see, with the, a product-led approach, we were actually able to give people the product, our freemium products, um, help them become successful by creating an incredible user experience, and then they were 10 times more likely to become a paying customer. So it really changed the way I saw that your product could actually be a customer acquisition model. And so that's why I'm here today. It's really because I'm fascinated with how the world of product is quickly changing and more people are starting to realize that our product isn't just something we sell. It's something we can also give and help more people learn about what it is that we offer people. So in this training, I'm going to do two things. So my first goal here is I want to break down what is product-led growth because many people try to overcomplicate it. And I'm gonna show you that it's actually something pretty simple that you can start using in your business right after this talk. And the second thing I'm gonna cover in this talk is a framework that you can use to help people become successful in your product. So if you're ready, let's dive in. Let's start off with what is product-led growth? Think about it. What is it, product-led growth? We're using our product to lead the growth. If <laughs> you think about it that way. So before I, I answer that question, I'm actually gonna share with you some interesting examples to make you think about this whole new product-led movement is actually something that's not too new. This has been around for a very long time. So even if we look at cologne, for an example, or perfume, you're going to try that product before you buy it. Most likely, you're going to put it on, see if it smells good, and if you like it. Now, if you do like it, your chances of actually buying that product skyrocket. Now, if it's really ugly and you, know, you just hate that smell, you're probably not going to buy it. Now, same thing goes whenever you're looking at buying a car. So, Cars are really expensive for a lot of people, unless you're billionaires. It's something that you will actually spend a lot of time figuring out which car you want to buy. And so part of that buying process is really just the test drive. That is their free trial or freemium model, if you'll have it, is that. And so that is really a core part of the buying experience of a car. And now my favorite one is whenever you're at Costco and you get to try a sample of some food that you might not have otherwise tried. And so this is really, we can see whether it's in retail, car industry, or also just at the very beginning with cologne and perfume. Product-led growth has already been around. It's just becoming a lot easier for SaaS companies to apply and use the same strategies that have already been a part of the buying experience that people expect from many different industries. So 
the question is, is product-led growth just about trying before you buy? It's a big question. And I would argue it's not. So what I'm going to share with you is what I think is the true definition of product-led growth. So what are these product-led businesses doing different? It's interesting. So I am going to share with you what I truly believe product-led businesses do different versus the more traditional sales-led companies. So this is a simple graph where essentially we have perceived value, which is what we promise someone, and experience value, which is essentially what the whole experience was in the product. Now, the very best companies in the world, they're insanely good at making sure that the perceived value of what they promised lines up exactly or even um, better than they experienced value. And so when that happens, people are happy with what you got promised and the overall experience. And so they walk away happy. And if that's a trial experience, they're 10 times more likely to become a paying customer. And so that's really the goal. But it almost sounds too easy if being a product-led business is really just about giving people really that experience that lines up perfectly with their perceived value and the experience value is just that. Um, why can't everyone do it? Why not? So the main problem here is really one big thing, which I dubbed time to value. Time to value is really a novel idea because if we think about time to value, one of the most important things we need to think about is how quick does it take for someone to really experience our product's value? So, but another way is when someone tries your product, how long does it take them to experience the value? Now, most sales-led companies and even some product-led companies have a very long time to value. And that's okay in some industries, but for many, B2B buyers, what they're expecting today is that whenever they're promised something, they want to get to that experience value as soon as possible. If not, there's a thing called a value gap, which is really just a misaligned expectation. You promise them one thing and the experience value just doesn't line up. So when that happens, people just don't convert. They do not convert. And that ultimately means that your business struggles as a result. So I'll give you an example. So I was talking with Chris, who is the CEO of Snappa.com, and they make it super simple for people to create online graphics. And so they have thousands of thousands of signups every single week. And so I was super curious to kind of dig into his funnel and see you know, where we could work and worker magic, essentially. And so I asked Chris, like, okay, how many of those signups convert on your homepage? You would not believe their website homepage conversion rate. Unbelievable. Um, but then I started looking more into, okay, out of everyone who signs up for your product, how many of them actually go into the product? So Chris didn't know at that time, which like most CEOs, um, it's hard to track all the metrics in your business. So I was like, get back to me on that one. I'm curious about this. So an hour later, <laughs> he pulls up the mix panel, looks into it. And what Chris realizes is 27% of all his signups never actually went into the product. Now that's pretty scary when you're at the level and volume of signups as Chris is since he's in the B2C space. It was just bonkers. 27% of people were not going into the product. So essentially what was happening is, well, people were being promised, create these online graphics in a snap, but what was actually happening, the experience value was, well, it was actually taking people over 10 minutes to create that online graphic. Now we looked into it and we said, why are those 27% of people not going into the product? And what we came up with was the fact that there is this one step, which might not sound like a big thing, but this one step, which is called the email activation confirmation step, 
is really a big deterrent from anyone who wanted to just try out Chris's software. So if you think about this step, it's common practice for most SaaS companies, but there's a lot of baggage you're requiring people to go through. First, if someone has to activate their email, they have to go to, let's say, Gmail, go to that, find that email, click that email, click the link in that email, and then depending on how you have that uh, link set up in the email, they might have to re-log in. And if they forget the password, then if you're like me, you might have to click that forget the password, reset password, and go back to your email, click that email. So it could be anywhere between five to 15 steps for this one step. So it's a big ask. And so what was happening is 27% of people were signing up or maybe not too interested or weren't willing to invest all that time. And maybe they went to the email with the best of intentions, but then they saw an email from their boss and they just decided this is higher priority than just checking out the software. I'm going to check out this email versus this one. So it was a really big step. And so I asked Chris and said, do we really need to have this step? Could we potentially just delay this step so that the first time someone signs up for your product, they can immediately go into the product and start seeing value from it. So he decided, okay, let's let's give it a shot. And so we did. And almost overnight, whenever we remove those email confirmations, we saw that Chris's monthly recurring revenue started going up and up and up. And it was so incredible. Chris was excited. He had to send me all the screenshots because he didn't believe it himself that just removing this one step had such a big impact on his bottom line. And a big part of that was because we had tackled time to value because we made it easier for people to sign up and actually get to the experienced value that we promised people on the website, people were upgrading in troves. And so that was what was really incredible. And so when, what I want you to think about is how do we eliminate the value gap? If it's just as simple as this, if building a world-class product-led business is as simple as helping people experience the value that we promise them and letting our product sell itself, how do we eliminate this value gap? It's a big question and it's honestly taken me about five years to figure out a framework to really help companies at scale do this successfully. So I want you to meet the Bowling Alley framework. So this is one of the most powerful frameworks you can use as a business to really help people become successful in your product. So how it works, much like bowling, is pretend you have a bowling ball. The whole point is really to knock down as many pins as possible. Now, if you're a beginner bowler, what you're often taught is see the straight line in the middle, roll the ball down that straight line. <laughs> I'm gonna knock down my desk here. And then you're gonna knock down as many pins as possible. And so if that happens, you are most likely going to win if you keep getting strikes. Uh, it's pretty hard to keep up. But if you're like most beginners, what's going to happen is that ball, even if you have the best intentions of rolling it down that straight line, you're probably going to get it in the gutter, maybe four out of 10 or maybe six out of 10 times. If you're a kid, it's probably going to be higher. And so that's a lot of gutter balls. And so what I want you to focus on for the first part of this is really just how can we build a straight line onboarding experience? So essentially what we're going to work on first is what are those absolute minimum number of steps required for a user to experience value in our product? Now, if we can get crystal clear on what that straight line is, it's going to be a lot easier for people to find it in our product. And what we're going to get into in part two and three is how do we layer on bumpers to really make sure that it's almost impossible for people to not see value from our product. That is the goal. We want to make it as easy as possible because in bowling, believe it or not, they actually had a really interesting retention issue. They noticed that you know people who were playing bowling again and again, they were really just the veterans of the industry, but they didn't have a lot of new people 
coming into the industry. And so they really had to figure out how can we make bowling easier so we can increase our total addressable market. Kids would even want to play because right now their parents are schooling them and so the kids aren't too happy about that. And so how can we make it easier? And so they came up with a brilliant idea of layering on bumpers. And so we'll get to that in a bit. But what I want us to focus on is essentially this whole straight line onboarding concept. If point A is, is someone signing up for your product, reading your website copy, and the second point is getting them to strike out, see value in our product, how do we get them to that point as soon as humanly possible? So last November, I was in Florianapolis, Brazil, which if you ever have a chance to visit, it's incredible. Um, so many beaches, but that's beside the point. In the bottom point, I was in Lagoa, which is, there's lots of lakes, lots of beaches. So I was just exploring with my partner. And so we decided it was around 6 p.m. We we're like, okay, we've had a full day, we're exhausted. Um, let's, let's drive up to where our hotel is, which is at the top of the island. And so in that whole process, what ended up happening is we found out that Florianapolis has the worst, absolute worst traffic in the middle of the island. Now, mind you, it's beautiful. So if it's like your first time, it's not the end of the world, but it's painful still because it just takes forever to get through this part of town. And so what I was thinking about this whole time is like, how terrible is this experience? And then I got to the point where we got a little bit past the middle of the city and I witnessed something. The government actually really does care about this stuff. They had spent millions of dollars drilling tunnels through the mountains to get you from point A to point B of the island so much faster. And what it got me thinking about is that if a government can drill a hole through a mountain to help you get from point A to point B faster, can you start thinking about what are some of those little steps that get in the way of your user striking out in your product? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give you three questions that will help you identify what are those things that get in the way of your user seeing value in your product and how can you eliminate them? There's just three questions. Feel free to write them down if you want, but it's gonna be extremely clarifying for some of you to figure out what it is that you need to do to build a straight line onboarding experience that fast tracks your users who sign up to the point where they say, I get it, the product has sold itself, I understand the value of it on my own terms. So the first question you have to ask yourself is what steps can be eliminated? Think of all the unnecessary form fields in the world. For instance, I made this lovely form where to get a 20% discount, you're required for your, add your company name, your phone number, um, also your website, your birthday, and all these other crazy things you probably would never ask. And so if you think about this, like what is actually necessary for us to send someone a discount? There's an email. Think about for your product, what is actually necessary for someone when they sign up? It's an email. Everything else is bonus. Now I know for a lot of demand gen teams, I was on the demand gen team. At one point, there's reasons of why we might want people to give us extra information, whether it's for segmentation or different things. That's fine, but identify like what are those must haves and everything else that is there that is optional, let's just remove that. So the first question is what steps can be eliminated? So form fields are a perfect thing. And oftentimes you're gonna have a lot of other steps in there that could also be removed. So the next question I want you to ask yourself is what steps can we delay? Now think about that. In the majority of onboarding experiences, what a lot of people try and do is onboard you throughout the entire product. And so that can be pretty overwhelming when you think about it because what you're essentially doing is saying, hey, you just signed up for the product. 
um, here's our video solution, here's our uh, marketing solution, here's our customer success solution. I'm not saying your product can do all those things, but I'm sure you've seen it. And when you do, it doesn't actually help you solve your issue because they're just trying to show you the whole product at the same time. So think about what steps can we delay? An example here is whenever you signed up for Slack, you weren't required to necessarily um, sign up and do all your integrations right at the beginning. In fact, let's say you, just like me, put in your Google Drive link, tried to send it to someone. Well, you got a little notification saying, hey, would you like to set up the Google Drive integration? So it was contextual. It was based on where I was in the customer journey and not just at the very beginning of the onslaught of onboarding of all the things I had to do. No, it was based on what I was actually using and it's a very natural way to make sure that, okay, they're still onboarding me, but it's not doesn't have to be all at the beginning. And so think about what steps can we delay in our onboarding? Now, the next question I want you to think about is what are those mission critical steps? Now, I'm gonna share with you a product that we probably all know. Does everyone here know Google Analytics? All right, perfect. <laughs> And so Google Analytics is pretty much useless if you don't have this one step down, which is the JavaScript. If you don't put the JavaScript on your website, they can't track anything. They don't know who is actually on your website or anything else. So until you do that one step, the product is useless. So that's a mission critical step for your own product. What are those mission critical steps? What are they? We all have mission critical steps that we need to have. And so it's just a matter of identifying them. Then once you can do that, you can build a straight line onboarding experience. You see the goal here out of these three questions is to really focus on, okay, what can we eliminate? Let's start with that, eliminate those steps. What can we delay? What is like mission critical? And at the end of it, you're left with a few steps that are mission critical that you need to help someone see value in your product. And once you get to that point, what's really incredible about it is that you have oftentimes, most times I even just go through these three questions at companies, you can shave off anywhere from 20 to even 75% of your onboarding steps. And by doing so, your time to value in your product is often cut in half. And that means more people are able to experience the value of your product, which is ultimately the, the whole reason we're doing this at the end of the day, so we can help people with our products. And so the very interesting thing that I think is an epidemic in SaaS is that we're all okay with not really knowing what this number is. And this number, I think about it a lot, and it scares me. And the number when you know what it is, it'll scare you too, which is the fact that 40 to 60% of people who sign up for your product will never come back. That's a lot of people. 40 to 60% of people who sign up for your product will never come back. Now think about why that is. Why do people not want to come back to your product? It's not because they hate you. Believe me, people in that 40 to 60% they would have been amazing customers, but they just don't come back. So the biggest part of it is because your product has no bumpers. And that is not just because that is part of the framework. It is because it's not easy for them to see value. Think about the first time a kindergartner or someone who plays bowling, their first experience, if there's no bumpers, they're going to play bowling, and almost all of those balls are gonna go in the gutter. They're gonna feel like they're the problem, they're not successful, because the game's just rigged for them. It's gonna be way harder for them than their parents to play bowling. And so what the bowling associations have built is a way for even young kids to enjoy playing bowling, which is through adding bumpers. So in your product, these are the most powerful things you can do is what are those product bumpers you could use to guide people along the straight line onboarding experience? You see, once you have those mission critical steps, 
that you need someone to get them from sign up to first value. It's a matter of how can we make that even easier for them? We know those steps. Let's guide them, whether it's a product tour, a tool tip or something. How can we make it so easy for this person to see value? So what are some of those examples of product pumpers? While you're thinking, I'll give you the most common ones, but I don't want you to just limit it to them because there are so many others out there that I'll just give you the most common and you can see so many others on your own. So product tours are by far one of the most, uh, of my favorite ones at least. And the reason why is because product tours are really powerful at the beginning of any onboarding experience. And here's why. So whenever you sign up for a product, you can ask people, what are you hoping to accomplish? And you could have a few options. So in Wave's case, which they're a accounting application, they ask people, do you want to capture our receipts, organize your finances, or get paid for your work? And since they are a multi-product company, they're able to identify, here's the job that someone wants to get done with our product. And then based on what someone selects, they're actually helping you do just that at the very beginning of the onboarding journey. So product tours are incredible at helping people get to the point of value fast. And that's why I think they're really powerful. Now, the next one is checklists. So checklists are really kind of interesting because what you're trying to do is identify like what are those steps that someone needs to do to see value. So for instance, in your straight line onboarding structure that we were talking about, like what are those mission critical steps? If you could put them in a checklist, you actually will be making it so much easier for someone to see value in your product because you've already done the heavy lifting of identifying like here are the steps that you actually have to do to see value in a product. Here's a checklist to go through them and we'll just help you make it easier. And so the next one is empty states. Now I call this the most valuable real estate in your entire product. Now the funny thing is, is most people don't know where this is. They have zero ideas. And so when you think about empty states, I want you to think about your dashboard. Most SaaS applications, when you first sign up for them, you go to that dashboard and there's like nothing there. It's just empty, maybe there's a bunch of zeros and it doesn't tell you anything meaningful. And that is because the product's useless. You have to do specific things, whether it's integrations or anything else, to start seeing some value from that product. And so what do you do with that space? You could just give them a simple call to action. In this case, it was for a dashboard tool where they just say, start building your dashboard, add data, integrate something, and we'll show you the rest. And so what's great about using the space is instead of showing blank dashboards to people when they first log in, you can actually show them like, here's what you need to do to see value from this product. And so it's incredibly powerful to use this product bumper to show people like, here's what you need to do now if you want to see value. And so the last product bumper I'll go through with you is called onboarding tool tips. So these are so common nowadays. It's amazing, but they can be abused. <laughs> and so the most common reasons I've seen people use onboarding tool tips is really two main use cases. Use case number one, I want to educate people on how to do something in my product. So if you signed up for Slack, using these examples, since we all know Slack, is really just let's educate people on how to communicate differently. Like what is a channel, for instance, the first time you log in, it's good to know that because if you've never logged into Slack before, channels are this new concept that's not like email, it's a little different. So we need to educate people on that. And the second use case of onboarding tooltips is actually just to guide people. So through the straight line onboarding steps, we could take people through everything they need to do to see value through the product. So those are the two main use cases, but what I see people doing again and again, which really bugs me, is using these tool tips to guide people through the entire product experience. And what it often feels like at the end is like whack-a-mole, <laughs> you're just trying to um, get rid of all of these onboarding tool tips because they're so annoying. And so the last part of the bowling alley framework 
is really the conversational bumper. So, so far we've identified what is the straight line onboarding experience? What are those absolute minimum number of steps required for us to see value in our product? And then what we've done is we've identified those steps and we've layered on product bumpers. Maybe it's a tooltip, maybe it's empty state, maybe it's a combination of both. And we made it super easy for people to complete those steps. Now it's a matter of the conversational bumper. And this bumper does something that no other part of the bumper can do, which is go to where the user is hanging out, whether that be on email, SMS, or anywhere else, and identify where they are in the journey and then bring them back to that experience. So before I get into too much of how to do this, get tactical, I wanna share the overall strategy behind it, which it actually starts with the manufacturing industry. So this is Toyota and Toyota has been around for a long time. One of the things that fascinates me about Toyota specifically is the way they have revolutionized the manufacturing industry. And so back when they were first starting, Mr. Toyota had this huge overhead problem. Whenever they placed big orders, let's say they ordered 100,000 Toyota Corollas, they would have to order all those parts, store all those parts, and then they would build those cars and then they start selling them. And so if let's say sales fell short and they're only able to sell actually 20,000 of those 100,000 cars, they're left with that 80,000 cars of inventory, which racks up to millions and millions of dollars if you have a couple of these failed launches, you go out of business, even as a very big business. And the fact that that could happen, even with such a big business, scared Mr. Toyota. And so he actually got inspired by the grocery store, which I think is such an interesting place to be inspired from. But if you think about the way Toyota was operating, they would essentially purchase a hundred grocery stores worth of food and supplies, and then they would store them. But what consumers do differently is they don't go out and buy all the food they need for the year. They just decide that this week, I'm going to shop once at the grocery store, maybe once for a smaller amount of time. But what they're looking for, most consumers at least, are searching for signals. Maybe their fridge is empty. Maybe they don't have a meal that they really want, or maybe they're just hungry. So there's specific signals that make consumers want to buy more food. And so it was just a matter of identifying what are those signals. And so Mr. Toyota started thinking about in business, what are those signals that we could look for that will tell us that, hey, we need to build another car. And so he started to build the just in time methodology versus the just in case methodology. And the reason I find this so interesting is because most people treat onboarding as just in case. We have a series of maybe 14, 15 emails over a 30 day trial period, and we're just shooting them off time-based to anyone. Hopefully it's helpful. And there's not a lot of thought into it. It's just, we hope you need this stuff just in case, but what I want you to do is build a just-in-time bumper that really reacts to where people are in their journey and how we can help them. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to share a few examples of signals. The signals that you, regardless of your product, need to look for and start crafting a customer journey that is based on these signals. So the first one is whenever someone signs up. So as soon as someone signs up, there's very specific things that we need to start doing. If someone signs up, what should we be driving people towards? Now, it doesn't matter. You don't have to squint your eyes or take photos if you don't want. But in this particular slide, what you want to think about is, okay, someone just signed up. What do we need to drive them towards? In this case, let's get them towards a quick win. If this is Google Analytics, they just had someone sign up. Let's get them to upload that script on their website. If we can do that, chances of success are much higher. So let's get them to do that. And that is the first signal you are looking for. Now, once someone has not done that, for instance, they sign up. And in this particular case, I created a video using Wistia, but I didn't actually share it with someone. So that was their perfect opportunity to send me a usage tip email saying, hey, 
you created your first video, but you never shared it with someone. So here's a link to do that. And if you know what Wistia does, it's video analytics. So it's a core part of the product. It's actually their unique selling point. And so because I didn't share it, they weren't actually able to show me the value of the product. And so by doing this and sending this email, they were setting themselves up for success and me up for success. Because once I shared it, I would have seen incredible stats on my first video. So whenever you think about that first signal and someone signs up, think about how we can get them closer to that quick win. And if people don't do specific things on our straight line onboarding experience, how can we react and send them, whether it's an email, some other message, doesn't matter the medium, that gets them closer to that next stage where they can see value in your product. So when someone has done that first quick win, back to that Google Analytics example, someone uploads that script to the website, what do we do now? Someone has experienced that first quick win, and the whole point at this point is really just, let's get them to the desired outcome. If it's Google Analytics, let's get them to see an important report that uncovers something that is incredible in their business. And so that's what we're driving towards Maybe it's more usage tip emails that help them identify, like here's how to access your report. You have some meaningful data. Maybe you just send the report to them. Here's the most, uh, I guess, top reports on Google Analytics that you might find relevant that's already pre-filled with your data, which is pretty cool because you could do that <laughs> and save people time from even logging in. And so the last signal I want you to think about is once someone has seen success in your product, now, most companies I talk to don't measure this. And it still surprises me because we're so focused on understanding, okay, out of how many of those leads who signed up, how many became paying customers, but we're not actually really great at measuring is how many of those people who signed up actually saw value in the product. And to me, that's the more interesting one because if we could focus on how many people signed up to how many people actually got to the desired outcome in the product and saw value, that's a lot more interesting. That has a much higher correlation to ultimately the revenue at the end of the day. And so when people do get to this point where they see the value of their product, it's really fascinating. And it's fascinating to me because your product has just sold itself. That's it. Your product has sold itself. When someone experiences the desired outcome in your product, that's a beautiful moment. That is when people say, ah, I can actually believe that copy. I understand your value proposition on my own terms. And the whole role of selling has changed. Sales can still be there. Sales is still a very important role, don't get me wrong, but your product has just done the majority of the heavy lifting. And so whenever someone gets to this point, what you gotta think about is, how do we actually make it easy for them to upgrade? And it's actually surprising. So many companies don't think about this, is we've got people focused on them and getting them to the success point in the product, but how do we make it easy for them to upgrade and become a happy paying customer? And so at this point, it's really just about, okay, maybe it's a sales outreach, maybe it's sending them a case study, or um, also just maybe a trial extension. And all of the call to actions here are really just upgrade your account. So it doesn't necessarily matter the specific emails you send out here. I'm not going to go through um, all the emails you need to send out. The point here is once someone has experienced the desired outcome in your product, you can sell because you've already done the majority of the selling. It's just about let's get them to that next step so they can upgrade and continue experiencing this value if that is what they want. And so ultimately what I'm hoping you learn today is that by using the bowling alley framework, you have a really simple way of understanding how you can help your users become successful. Now, it really starts with the straight line onboarding experience. And what that really is, is boiling down, like what are those absolute minimum number of steps it takes for someone to see success in our product? Once you get those all out, laid out, it can be on like sticky notes. It doesn't have to be fancy. Just understand what are those specific steps. Then you can start crafting a product experience with product bumpers that really helps people get through those specific steps through the product and ultimately strike out. And 
the conversational bumper is really just to help those 40 to 60% of people that will never come back to your product to identify where did they leave off throughout that whole journey and how can we bring them back? There was the Wistia example of, I didn't actually share the video with anyone. They recognized that. So they then sent me an email to make it easy for me to do exactly that. So think about how you could build this straightforward, simple onboarding journey to help your users become successful because ultimately what product-led growth is all about is making sure that we can deliver on the value that we promise people as soon as humanly possible. So to wrap up, what I really want you to think about here is this, it's the value gap. This is what's getting in your way of helping users experience the value of your product. This is what's getting in the way of helping the product sell itself. It's a lot of things, but really it's not too complicated. We have what we promise people and what the ultimate experience is. The value gap is just what gets in the way. If we're not actually delivering on that experience and doing an incredible job doing so, it's just going to hurt our conversion and hurt us from actually helping our users become successful. So the ultimate goal here throughout this talk, if you take nothing else away, it's this. I want you to build products where <laughs> what we promise is exactly what people experience and they can experience it as soon as humanly possible. Now, if you found any of this helpful, I want you to do this. Download the Bowling Alley Framework. Just go to bowlingalleyframework.com. It's free. And I will send you the PDF of chapter 13 of my book on product-led growth, which is all about the Bowling Alley Framework. And it's a really long guide, so uh, you've been warned. But it will actually go through exactly what it takes for you to implement this strategy on your own. Now, that's if you want the kind of do-it-yourself model. But if you want to have myself or someone on my team to go through with you how to implement the Bowling Alley Framework, we do offer three-day workshops on how to do just that and help you systematically turn your users into happy paying customers. So with that, I'm going to end this. But thank you for listening. I hope you found this framework really interesting and useful. And with that, I'm going to sign off, but have an amazing day.